Okay. So we are up and running. We're going to talk about hyperhidrosis. I think most of you, uh, or a lot of you, uh, may not have actually ever seen a case of hyperhidrosis. Though you may have read it in a textbook or something, uh, you probably would not have managed personally a case of hyperhidrosis. So that's why I thought uh, it's a good topic for me to take you through. Uh, and I'm going to take you through not just clinical side of things, but I will also talk about the uh, the the uh, theory behind it as well. So I'll try and clarify a few things so that the next time you see a patient with hypohydrosis, you're, you're well prepared to manage that patient, okay? Um, my style, as you have become aware by now, is all based on evidence. So everything that I talk, there is no statement on my slides which is not backed by paper or by literature. And uh, I usually try to follow international guidelines so that you guys can easily reproduce these guidelines whenever you have to manage the patient or you have to present in an MGT. So everything that I say is going to be based on guidelines and guidelines alone, okay? So let's start off with what are my basic guidelines that I'm following for this topic. Uh, the first guideline is from the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Now this is not a guideline. This is an expert consensus statement. Okay, there are two different types of things. One is a guideline where a whole group of people have sat through, they've gone through literature, and then they have put out guidelines. And the other is an expert consensus where the top experts in the world who are doing this type of surgery look at uh, whatever is available out there and they compare each other's practice. And then they say what in their clinical opinion is the best management. So the document that has come out of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons is an expert consensus. And if you look through the authors, some of these guys are the top guys who are doing uh, uh, hyperhidrosis surgery. So Robert Serfolio, uh, uh, Jose Campos, uh, Dan Miller from Atlanta, Mark Kresna. So all these guys are the top guys who are doing this sort of surgery and they've put out some statements. So I'm going to incorporate their statements into my talk so that you guys have solid evidence when you give an answer in the exam. The other guideline which is actually present around the world is something that comes from Spain. And this is actually a more uh, solid guideline which is based on various levels of recommendations. So they have a, a recommendation from R1 to R8 and you know, going from the top to the bottom, the level of recommendation goes down as in the evidence that backs the recommendation goes down. So every time I make a statement, at the side, there will be a statement saying R1, R2, R3, R4, whatever. That just means that the level of recommendation is high or low, okay? Uh, and this is the, uh, the, the, this is the grade system it's called as. And the Society of uh, Thoracoscopic Surgeons in Spain have used this uh, recommendation system. So they go from one to eight. So one is the high, highest quality of recommendation and eight is a weak quality of recommendation with very low evidence backing the recommendation, okay? So this is what we will follow when we talk about hyperhidrosis. So every time you see my slides, somewhere you see an R1 or an R2, it corresponds to this number, okay? This one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that is what I'm talking about. All right, the third uh, good guidelines which are available out there, is actually the NICE guidelines. But unfortunately in the UK, the NICE guidelines on hyperhidrosis is not very strong. It's not a full recommendation of management of uh, hyperhidrosis. It's just a few lines about whether endoscopic, thoracoscopic, endoscopic thoracic sympathectomy is suggested or not suggested. And I'll mention that somewhere in my talk. Uh, there, there are two societies which you need to be aware of. One is an international hyperhidrosis society. This is made up of uh, surgeons, made up of physicians, made up of dermatologists. There are a lot of different people actually who manage hyperhidrosis. So it's not just a surgical disease. It's actually managed by a huge group of people. Hence, a lot of different specialities come in and give uh, recommendations on what to do in cases of hyperhidrosis. So not everybody has surgery. There's a lot of conservative management as well. So you will see a lot of my talk today will involve conservative techniques, and I'll try to show you what are the conservative techniques with pictures. And this group is actually a surgical group. This is an international society of sympathetic surgery. 
Uh, I uh, attended their first meeting in 2009. And since then, I've been contributing to them. Uh, this is surgeons who talk about how to standardize sympathectomy, what are the steps in the sympathectomy, how to standardize the nomenclature of your surgery and things like that. And you'll come across this as I talk, you will understand more and more of what we are talking about, okay? So hyperhidrosis is sweating and flushing due to a heat or an emotional stimuli, which is in excess of the normal that is required for thermoregulation. So all of us sweat flushing because we need to regulate the temperature of the body. But hyperhidrosis is a clinical situation where your response to heat or emotional stimuli is highly exaggerated. And it is not what is required for thermoregulation. It is in far excess of what is required for thermoregulation. And the commonest areas that get affected are the palms, the soles, and the axilla. And each one of them has a different level of excitation and that is why you have to know what is the level of surgery that you need to do, depending upon where is the area that is getting affected. So it's quite an interesting topic and we'll go through it. So let's start off with first the anatomy of the sympathetic chain. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen what a sympathetic chain looks like. You may have seen it in videos in real life. You operate in the chest all the time, but very rarely do you pay attention to the sympathetic chain, which lies in the gutter or the groove of the paravertebral area along the neck of the ribs. So there is a left and a right sympathetic chain. There are 23 paired sympathetic ganglion which run from the top to the bottom. There are three cervical ganglia. There are 12 thoracic ganglia four lumbar ganglia, and four sacral ganglia, okay? If you look at these diagrams, this is how you will see these are all the ganglion which lie along the side. So it is not directly correlated to the number of intercostal foramina. It is related to where the nerves join together and form a ganglia. So here you can see a ganglia is lying between this nerve and this nerve. So it is not exactly at the same level of the afferent nerve. It lies between two afferent nerves. So you have what is called as a sympathetic chain, which is one to two millimeter in diameter. It is present below the parietal pleura. So it is not on the surface of the pleura. It is actually subpleural structure. It is present at the neck of each rib. The stellate ganglion is the important one. It is caused by the fusion of the lower cervical and the first thoracic ganglion. The anatomical landmark when you get into the chest is actually the second ganglion. That is where you are able to identify. And it usually lies at the fusion of the azygous with the SVC. That is the point. And the one that lies there is actually the second ganglion, not the first ganglion. It's not T1. So wherever the azygous fuses with the SVC, if you look just above it, you will see T2. On the left side, the second ganglion lies just above the aortic arch. So the first ganglion on both the sides lies right at the thoracic outlet, almost out of reach of your direct vision. The first one that you see is usually actually the second ganglion. And that's the one that you need to be aware of. There is a lot of aberrant anatomy. There are double sympathetic chains. There is something called as nerve of Kunz, and we'll talk about this in a minute. So if you get into the chest and you put in a thoracoscope, this is the view you get. Usually you see the second rib and the ganglion which is corresponding with the second rib is a T2 ganglion. You do not see the first rib. So you see straight on, you see a sympathetic chain in the paravertebral gutter and the ganglion which is closest to the second rib is T2. This is the third rib, there's T3. Fourth rib, T4. Now the problem is, previously people used to talk of sympathetic surgery with relation to 
T. Now, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons have changed the nomenclature and they have said that you don't really cut T. What you cut is the sympathetic chain above or below T. So they have said that instead of calling it as T2 surgery or T2 ganglion surgery, you should actually name it with relation to the rib. And I'll talk about it in a little more thing. So instead of a T, the number has changed to R. So when we used to say second sympathetic ganglion and third sympathetic ganglion, nowadays sympathetic surgery talks about R. R is either R top or R bottom, which means you have cut the sympathetic chain on the top of the rib. R2 means rib 2. Can you see your R2? So you cut the sympathetic ganglion here, you cut the sympathetic ganglion here. You never cut on the ganglion. You always cut the sympathetic chain. So the nomenclature has changed from time to time and a lot of textbooks still are carrying T ganglion and T2, T3, T4, but that has changed. Nobody uses these terminologies T and G. Nowadays people use R and that is something that you've got to remember. And you'll, it'll become more clearer as we go on, okay? So this is just the anatomy of the outlet as you see it. Usually the first rib is out of view. That's the point I was trying to make. So you cannot see the first rib. The first rib that you see is the second rib in the view of the thoracic outlet. And the ganglion which is associated with it is T2, but it is not on the second rib. It's slightly below the second rib, okay? And the nerve of Kunz, as you can see, this is a sympathetic chain and all the sympathetic chain and all the ganglia are interconnected by a bypass or by a circuitous route called as nerve of Kunz. This is a collateral that comes from the sympathetic ganglion and rejoins the sympathetic ganglion. So when you do a surgery, and you do sympathectomy and you cut this ganglion here or you cut this chain here and you do not go laterally and cut the nerves of foot, then there is very high chances that you will get recurrence of symptoms because the impulse comes to the ganglion. It finds that the ganglion or the sympathetic chain is cut. So it takes a divertus route and then moves along the nerve of Kunz and then rejoins at the top. So most failure of sympathetic surgery happens because people do not realize the presence of this collateral nerve of Kunz. So this is very important concept that you've got to remember when you're talking about sympathetic surgery. Okay, is it, be, is it clear? Am I going slow enough or do you want me to slow down a bit more? Somebody just reply back. It's fine. Sir. It's fine, sir. Fine. Thank okay. you. Thank you. It's making sense what I'm saying. Yes. All yes. Right. Okay. So let's carry on. Sweating. Now, what is the pathophysiology of sweating? Because this is whole game is about sweating. Whole game is about how to stop sweating. So you need to know the pathway of the sweating nervous system. So the central connection is in a something called as a hypothalamic preoperative, preoptic sweat center. So hypothalamic preoptic sweat center. You don't need to know the whole, uh, you know, uh, nervous chain all the way up to there. But sometimes in an exam, somebody might ask you, what is the central uh, control of sweating? Because you've got a case with the uh, hyperhidrosis. So it's good to know what is the central control. It is present in the hypothalamus and it's called as a sweat center. As simple as that. Okay. There is something called a sensory afferents, which means these are connections which carry the stimulus from the periphery to the center. Afferents, these are pathways which carry the stimulus from the periphery to the center. And the common two stimuli are heat or emotional stress or distress, whatever you want to call it. These get carried via the pathway all the way to the uh, sensory center. The hypothalamic sweat center gets excited. It sends back its uh, signal and the signal comes down via the spinal cord and goes via efferent 
ganglionic fibers via the sympathetic chain to the sweat gland. So the previous picture which I showed you, I'll just show it to you again. Uh, this picture, this is the pathway. So there is an afferent which goes up to the brain and then there is an efferent which comes down and then goes to the periphery and supplies the various areas which respond to the heat and the stimuli, okay? So let's get back to that. Something like this, okay? So here is the afferent going up and then there is the efferent coming down and the efferent here, can you see this? This is going to sweat glands and it goes to a lot of other organs in the body. So we are not really concerned with the other organs at the moment. We are only going to focus on this pathway to the sweat glands, okay? So don't, no need to know big details about this, but just understand that there is a stimulus, there is an afferent, there is a spinal cord, there is a central connection, there is an efferent, which comes down via spinal cord, comes to the sympathetic ganglion, and then gets distributed back to the sweat gland. It's as simple as that. It's just one single circuit that you have to remember. So a standard thought process is that the T1 controls facial sweat glands, a T2 and a T3 controls palmar sweat glands, and a T4 controls axillary sweat glands. At this moment, I'm taking the liberty of using the word T because here we are talking about anatomy. We're not talking about surgery. When we talk about surgery, we will change the terminology from T to R because R is a level of transaction. T suggests a ganglion. Understand this difference. What is R and what is T? So R, when I say, I'm talking about where you are transacting the sympathetic chain. But when we talk about T, we are talking about a ganglion. So T1 is the first thoracic ganglion, which controls facial uh, sweat glands. T2, T3 controls palmar sweat glands. And T4 controls axillary sweat glands. Just stay with this at the moment. Let's not get into the details of which one we have to cut. We'll talk about that a bit later. This is just to get the basics into picture so that we can then decide what is our level of transaction. Okay, again, now we have spoken about afferents and efferents. There are two types of sweat glands in the body because we got to talk about the target organ. The target organ is sweat glands. So there is something called as the apocrine sweat gland. These are usually present in hair dense areas. So axilla and groin are common examples of afferent sweat glands, uh, of apocrine sweat glands. And these glands sweat directly via the hair follicles. So they don't sweat via the sweat gland, they sweat via the hair follicle. As opposed to this, there is something called as eccrine sweat glands. Eccrine sweat glands are sweat glands which are present all over the body. These sweat via skin pores. So eccrine sweat glands have their own connection with the skin, whereas apocrine sweat glands open into the base of the hair root and they join and they sweat via the hair. There's, a dis there's importance of understanding this because there are various therapies which treat different types of sweat glands, okay? Hyperhidrosis is defined when the sweat is always in excess of that required for normal thermal regulation, okay? I'm sorry, my uh, this is coming a bit uh, upside down, but it's okay. So hyperhidrosis is uh, classified as either localized or generalized. So there are two types of hyperhidrosis. Either it is localized, and when we are talking about localized hyperhidrosis, we are talking about palmar, talking about gustatory, which means in response to food stimulus. We're talking about cervical, we're talking about axillary, we're talking about thoracic, and we're talking about abdominal. These are localized because these are localized to individual ganglions. And we can actually point out what is the area from where they're coming. The next type of classification is generalized. 
And generalized is usually emotionally induced hyperhidrosis. So these are usually the ones which are related to palm soles and axilla. So most of the people who are emotionally hyper and think, they will get a generalized hyperhidrosis. But people who have got specific diseases will actually show localized hyperhidrosis in response to a particular disease in a particular area. Okay, is this clear? So two types of hyperhidrosis, two types of sweat glands. This message I want to get across to you. Okay. Two types of hyperhidrosis, in addition to localized and generalized, hyperhidrosis is also classified as primary and secondary. So classifications we've gone, one is localized and generalized, and the next classification is primary and secondary. It's very, very, very important, this classification, because treatment directly changes depending upon what is the type of hyperhidrosis. Primary hyperhidrosis is overall overactivity of a sympathetic nervous system. So it's directly related to the sympathetic nervous system. And this is the diagnostic criteria for a primary hyperhidrosis. So you've got to have at least three or four of these factors for the diagnosis to be called as primary focal hyperhidrosis. And this is from the guidelines. And it says you must have focal, visible, excessive sweating for at least six months. And you should not have any other systemic cause. That's one. And at least one of the following characteristics must be present. It is usually bilateral. It is usually symmetrical. So if your right axilla is sweating and your left axilla is sweating and you don't have any systemic disease and it's been going on for six months, your diagnosis is primary focal hyperhidrosis. The frequency of the sweating or the frequency of these episodes should be at least one per week. More, but not less. If it is happening once a month, maybe this is not hyperhidrosis. It should interfere with your daily activities. This is very, very, very important because when you decide to treat a patient, the treatment is directly correlated to the impact of the disease on the quality of life of the patient. Remember, these are all very, very anxious, very nervous patients. These are people who are afraid to shake hands with people. These are people who are socially shy. These are people who have been withdrawn from uh, for a very long time before they come to see you. So if you want to offer surgery, you've got to be very careful in selecting the correct patient so that you give the maximum benefit of treatment to the patient. And that is why we look at two types of analysis when we do analysis for these patients. One is a quantitative analysis where we look at how much sweat is formed and things like that. But a more important part of decision making as to when to treat or how to treat depends on the qualitative analysis, which means how much is the patient's lifestyle affected. It's a very important factor in this type of treatment. Uh, no other pathology actually is so much dependent on how much is a patient socially impacted. You really need to make sure that these patients earn the surgery. You should not offer sympathectomy to everybody willy-nilly. You must make sure that these patients earn the surgery, they deserve the surgery, or they merit the surgery. So you have to quantify how much is this guy's daily life activities affected? Usually they are young patients. Most of them are below 25. So it's a very awkward phase of life for them. And you'll find them to be very withdrawal. These patients are a very difficult set of patients to deal with. There must be a family history of hyperhidrosis. Very, very common. And most importantly, these guys do not have hyperhidrosis when they are asleep. That is the key thing. 
because if they if they've got a hyperhidrosis even when they are sleeping that means that something else is going on this is not a sympathetic or a parasympathetic stimulation there is something physically wrong with the sweat gland or something else these guys for sympathectomy to work or for any procedure to work there must be a demonstration of excessive sympathetic response to a stimuli so most of these guys surprisingly will tell you that when they go to sleep nothing happens they wake up with dry axilla dry faces but moment they start the day moment anything happens they start flushing up and things get very difficult so this is quite important to know how to diagnose primary hyperhidrosis because primary hyperhidrosis responds to treatment secondary hyperhidrosis usually will not respond to sympathetic treatment you have to treat the underlying cause that has caused the secondary hyperhidrosis so secondary hyperhidrosis has many pathologies and we'll just quickly go through them for completion sake a lot of this uh, talk is making sure that i cover everything so the causes of secondary hyperhidrosis could be neurological which is secondary to peripheral neuropathy could be parkinson's disease spinal cord injury reflex sympathetic dystrophy or it could be secondary to metabolic disease thyrotoxicosis diabetes mellitus pheochromocytoma is known to cause hyperhidrosis hyperpituitarism is known to cause pregnancy can cause it and carcinoids because of the carcinoid syndrome can cause hyperhidrosis now in all of these patients if you offer them sympathectomy or you offer them botox injections you are not going to make two bits of difference because you really need to treat the underlying disease not the the effect and that is why it's very important to differentiate hyperhidrosis between primary and secondary the other common causes of secondary hyperhidrosis could be infections like tuberculosis malignancies like leukemia and lymphoma chronic alcoholism is known to be associated with hyperhidrosis and a lot of medication actually stimulate the sympathetic system things like cholinesterase inhibitors tricyclic antidepressants serotonin reuptake inhibitors there are a lot of medications which are known to known to cause secondary hyperhidrosis as a side effect and so in these cases none of your treatment will work because you need to treat the underlying cause so this is the guideline which talks about all the secondary causes so when you assess these people you actually have to assess them very carefully to make sure that you are not missing a secondary cause of hyperhidrosis now this is just for completion again 1 to 2% of people have hyperhidrosis men are usually more affected than women usually localized hyperhidrosis is seen during puberty generalized is seen more in adulthood um uh, excessive sweating i told you i told you about the eccrine sites which is the axilla sole face usually they are bilateral symmetric distribution episodes are at least once a week and most importantly they are absent at night i've repeated this because this is mandatory in the history taking so when you take the history you will be able to tell me straight away whether this guy will benefit with treatment or not even before you examine you from the history itself you will be able to tell me this is a guy whom we should start treating uh onset is usually less than 25 we spoke about this we spoke about this we spoke about social awkwardness and the frequent change of clothing that's another thing which i forgot to mention now harlequin syndrome i'm going to ask a few people anybody knows what is harlequin syndrome you can log in and tell me i don't mind anybody's heard of the word harlequin syndrome north south syndrome what does it come what does it constitute okay let uh, me continue the lecture yeah who is that okay differential cyanosis yeah oh my god this is a cardiac surgeon isn't it differential yeah. cyanosis i love that <laughs> autonomic disorder which causes no. reduced flushing and sweating but usually it is only on one side okay usually on half of the face half of the neck 
half of the upper chest, usually in response to heat and exercise. And it is seen commonly when there is unilateral injury to a sympathetic chain. Ipsilateral half, which is denerv, ipsilateral half becomes denervated and the contralateral half becomes hyperactive. So you get this sort of a picture. So one half is hyperactive, one half has got no symptoms whatsoever. Now, which side is affected? Which sympathetic chain is affected? Left side. Good. So it is the left side that actually is affected in this patient. All right. So his left has been damaged. So the right has been hyperactive. Now in this guy, if you try and do something on the left side, he's not going to get the response. It's the right side you need to sort out if you do need to sort it out. So this is what a Harlequin syndrome looks like. Very classical, one half hyperactive, one half no action whatsoever, completely dumb. The other thing is called as phrase syndrome. These are two words you need to know when you're talking about hyper, uh, hyperhidrosis. These are usually gustatory sweating and it is usually secondary to injury to the facial nerve. And this is seen specifically following parotid gland surgery when there has been either a parotid gland surgery or a thoracic sympathectomy, but there has been an aberrant nerve regeneration. So you get this sort of localized. Can you see the scar of parotid surgery? So this guy is getting localized flushing because some nerve has regenerated beyond the facial nerve which was damaged and that's causing him the syndrome, okay? So two, two syndromes that you need to remember. Okay, now how do you assess these guys for surgery? What are the various techniques available to you to assess these? So first, thing for, first and foremost, you need to know what is normal sweating, okay? So less than one mil square is normal sweating. In men, more than 100 milligrams for five mils axillae called as axillary hyperhidrosis. And I'll show you how we measure this. Uh, I'm sorry, this nine is a mistake. Uh, this is actually meant to be this. Okay, I forgot to do the, so it's not the, forget the nine, okay, it's a comma actually. So more than 100 milligrams per five minutes per axillae is axillary hyperhidrosis. More than 50 milligrams per five minutes per axillae is axillary hyperhidrosis in female. This is not male, it's female. Okay. All right. If in Palmer hyperhidrosis, the amount of sweat is more than 30 to 40 milligrams per minute, per meter square. So normal is one, but in hyperhidrosis, you get almost 100 times more or almost 20 times more because this is per five minutes. So more than 20 times. Again, here you're getting it more than 10 times. And here you're getting it more than 30 times. So it has got to be really significant for you to make a diagnosis of hyperhidrosis, okay? There are two types of testing that you do. One is quantitative and one is qualitative. Quantitative is when we are talking about amount of sweat per minute. And qualitative is when we are talking about quality of life, okay? And I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's go through all the quantitative tests that we have available in the market. Now, I'm gonna take five names. Please jot them down because when you have a clinical patient of hyperhidrosis and the discussion goes to management, they will ask you what are the quantitative tests that are available in the market for quantifying hyperhidrosis. So first is a ninhydrin sweat test. The second, is Miner's starch iodine test. I'll go through each one of this in a minute. The third is a gravimetric testing. The fourth is dynamic quantitative pseudometry. The fifth 
is evaporimetry, evaporimetry. Okay, I'm going to repeat this. Ninhydrin sweat, sweat test, miners starch iodine test, gravimetric testing, dynamic quantitative pseudometry, and evaporimetry. Now, each one of them, I'll show you some pictures so you will understand it quite clearly. Now, ninhydrin is a protein and it reacts with amino acids that are present in the sweat. And when these people put their hands onto a paper, the ninhydrin and the amino acids get activated and they leave a mark. And everything that is highlighted in this area on this picture is sweating. So when there is a darker color, there is more sweating. When there is a lesser color, there's less sweating. But if a normal person puts his hand, his hand will give a very, very light test. Okay, it's not so dark. Whereas a person with hyperhidrosis will give a very dark test the moment he puts his hand onto this paper. Okay, that's ninhydrin sweat test. So it's ninhydrin is a dye and amino acids, they react together and the sweat has these things and it activates the paper. This is a special paper which is present on which the patient places the hand and you get this sort of a picture, okay? The second one is called as Miner's iodine starch test. Now I'm gonna talk about this in a minute when I talk about Botex. So just leave this for a minute. What you, you do here is you put starch onto an area and you see the response. And I'll show you in a minute what happens, okay? Gravimetric testing is you take a special paper and you measure it on one of these uh, gravimetric analysis machine. And then you put the paper to the area that is affected. The moment you put the paper to the area that is affected, it will start absorbing all of the sweat. And then you wait for a certain amount of time, which could be one minute or could be five minutes. And then you take the paper and put it back on this gravimetric analysis. And it actually tells you how much ML of sweat per minute or how much ML of sweat per five minutes. When I told you the first slide, the previous slide, where I spoke about more than 100 ML of sweat per five minutes, this is how you do it. You do gravimetric testing to understand how much is this guy sweating. In a normal circumstances, it should be one ml per minute per meter square. That is normal. Whereas using the gravimetric testing, you can show it to be 100 or 50 or whatever is the number for the patient. The third way to do it is evaporimetry. This is not evaporimetry, evaporimetry. It actually looks at the amount of evaporated sweat. So what you do is you keep the patient in a chamber. And what you're trying to find out is the amount of sweat that is evaporating off the surface of the body and the relative change in the humidity of that chamber. So it measures the humidity of that chamber and then tells you how much sweat per minute this patient uh, gave out. So it actually calculates what is called as trans epidermal water loss. So it's an evapor evaporimetry test, which tells you exactly how much is the amount of water which is lost from the surface of the skin of this patient. And the fourth one is dynamic quantitative pseudometry. It actually measures the amount of moisture that is absorbed. So what we do is the guy with the sweaty hand is kept in a chamber and dried gas is passed over that. And the dried gas gets, absorbs the sweat away. And then you use an analysis to find out what is the humidity or the density of the gas. And that gives you an indirect reading of what's happening, how much amount of sweat is coming out of the, out of the hand. So these are the five methods in which you can use to find out what is the amount of sweating. Does this patient qualify to be called as hyperhidrosis or not? That is why you do these testing. testing. The other one that you have to do, and this is very, very, very important, is because these guys need to really earn their surgery. If their symptoms are less and they are socially less affected 
by uh, the problems that they are facing, then you offer them surgery, they will not be happy bunny because some of them get compensatory hyperhidrosis. And so, you know, if a patient is really sweating a lot and if he's really symptomatic, then a little bit of compensatory hyperhidrosis he can manage and he's happy. But if a patient is sweating a little bit and you offer him treatment and he gets a massive amount of compensatory hyperhidrosis, he will sue you. So that is why it's very important to understand what is the effect of the disease on the quality of life of the patient. This is the same principle that we follow when we do lung volume reduction surgery. When we do lung volume reduction surgery, we need to make sure that the patient has got very severe symptoms, so much so that he should be short of breath at rest. When you put such a patient through a very complex procedure like lung volume reduction surgery with its associated morbidity, then when the patient comes out on the other side, he really appreciates the surgery because on the baseline, he's sitting on a chair, not able to get out. And on the other side, he manages to walk and is able to mobilize around his house or a little bit more. So this patient will value your surgery. If the patient has very few symptoms, then he will really curse you for putting him through LVRS surgery and giving him chest pain from your wounds and things like that. Same principle follows in hyperhidrosis surgery. The patient has to earn the surgery. If you do it in people with very mild symptoms, they will curse you for compensatory hyperhidrosis and they will definitely sue you. So you've got to be very, very careful when you are analyzing a patient for surgical management. So we do what is called as quality of life test. Uh, there are four or five quality of life scales which I'm going to talk about. Just take it away with you and try to remember it. Or at least when you talk in an exam, talk about one or two quality of life tests. The commonest one is hyperhidrosis disease severity scale. You've also got an impact questionnaire. The dermatologists use their own uh, uh, assessment. It's called a DLQI, which is a dermatology life quality index. Uh, they also use, uh, so the, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more, just one minute. Let me tell you about the HDSS. This is the commonest one that we use. All of us use this. And the grading is from one to four. One is sweating is never noticeable, no interference with daily activity, certainly not a candidate for surgery or any intervention. The second is tolerable, but sometimes interferes with daily activity. I would not touch this guy. I would not offer him surgical treatment at all. The third is barely tolerable. So he's really starting to get symptoms, frequently interferes in the quality of life. This is the guy I will put him through a conservative management first and then see how he's responding. And then maybe I might eventually put him into a surgical arm. But the fourth guy, I'm very happy because he is really symptomatic. He's sweating intolerably, always interfering with his quality of life. And this is a guy whom I want to take up aggressively and put him through the, compensate, uh, through the conservative management. But very quickly, if he is not responding, I would give him surgery. So this scale actually helps you to identify which is the patient that you want to offer surgery. I have a problem because I see in India a lot of surgeons offering surgery for any Tom, Dick and Harry that walks through their clinic. And this is not a good thing because when these patients get compensatory hyperhidrosis, they will not thank you for it. So it is important to do qualitative assessment of these patients. A few other parameters are available. You can use the SF36. You can use something called as a Keller scale. There is something called as Skindex test and something called as illness intrusive rate scaling. My suggestion is when you talk in the exam about investigating a patient, you must talk in two terms. One is quantitative assessment of sweating and the other one is qualitative assessment on quality of life and you must know at least one or two of these parameters. And the hyperhidrosis severity scale is quite a standard one, which all of us use across the board. So even if you know one or two, I'll be quite happy to actually progress you into the next stage of the discussion. So let's look at what is the guidelines. 
the first thing they say is lab work is not necessary to diagnose primary hyperidemia most of the times it is actually a diagnosis of history taking a good history taking but it is important to rule out other diseases like secondary hyperidosis so if you are quite happy with that your history has ruled out everything else then you really don't need too much lab work to diagnose that this guy has got primary hyperidosis the history actually tells you what it is and the level of recommendation is r4 which is a you know medium quality of a, a recommendation not a very high quality but it's still there okay what about the therapies that are available so first thing first you do is you rule out secondary causes you always 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 have a psychological assessment to check the quality of life and you start them initially with only topical agents the topical agents that are available are aluminum hydrochloride if that doesn't work then you move on to systemic medication for generalized sweating if that doesn't work then you move on to intradermal botox and if that doesn't work you talk about tap water iontophoresis and i'll go through each one of this in a minute i'll tell you in detail about what are the various things that are available so all of this that i'm saying is directly from the guideline this is the spanish society guideline it says that you got to start with a conservative management the first choice should always be aluminum salt the second choice will be the systemic therapy the third choice will be botox so there is a guideline which is backing your answer so when you give this list in this order you are actually talking from the guidelines this is recommendation a 1.2 of the spear guidelines for uh, hyperhidrosis okay how does aluminum chloride work it is the dry chlor there are many other brands available it works best for axillary hyperhidrosis it is actually an antiperspirant so it is usually added to some other chemicals to deliver it into the area either you can get it as a roller ball or you can get it as a spray it has a metal ion aluminum in it which actually when it reacts with the sweat it precipitates mucopolysaccharides what these mucopolysaccharides do is they damage the epithelium of the sweat gland the moment they damage the epithelium of the sweat gland the sweat pores get blocked and because the sweat pore gets blocked there is no sweating in that area but the problem is the sympathetic stimulation is still there in the background the sweat is still collecting in the subcutaneous tissue though it is not coming out it will still be there in the body and it is predisposing the patient to have infections skin infections or getting multiple boils but these treatments need to be repeated frequently you need to give them at least once or twice a week over a long period of time this sort of treatment works very well for somebody with a grade 1 or a grade 2 level of symptom so i told you the hhss the hhss 1 somebody who's got some symptoms but is not bothering is not much bothered about it you can very easily write for him aluminum chloride and he will use it and his life gets on and he's not a problem so stage 1 and 2 aluminum chloride is okay stage 3 you start off with aluminum chloride and if it doesn't work then you have to move on to the next one the next one is botox now botox how does botox work botox works by various uh, two or three mechanism first the moment you inject the botox it inhibits neurotransmitter release from the cholinergic nerves by inhibiting the neurotransmitter release it abolishes the sweating by caused by the excessive acetylcholine okay so the pathway is blocked you're not blocking the nerve but you are blocking the pathway so the response to the stimulus is blocked it disrupts sweating by reducing the responsiveness of the sweat gland to acetylcholine and this is the paper which talks about it there's a lot of uh, data out there about use of botulinum toxin in uh, in uh, hyperhidrosis let me take you through how you do it the, i'll take you through the axilla so what you do is actually you first paint the axilla with povidone iodine 
And what we are doing here is we are doing the minus test, okay? So you paint the area with betadine and then you dust the area with fine starch. The moment you have dusted the area with fine starch, starch reacts with the, uh, with the salts in the, in the sweat and it turns into a purple color. A direct correlation of the density of the sweating. So the purple color directly correlates. If it's more purple or a larger area of purple, then it is a large area of sweating. What you do then is you take a pen and you mark out the purple area. You dust the other area and you mark out the purple area. And then once you have marked out the purple area, you have to mark the area with a distance of 1.5 centim 1 centimeters between each spot. So you've got to mark out multiple spots, usually about 15 to 20 per axilla. So you mark out this area, and then you take your Botox injection. The, the drug that is there is called as onabotulinum toxin A. Okay, onabotulinum toxin A. And you do about 12 to 15 injections in that area. So it is per axilla. In fact, one vial of onabotulinum toxin A can give you about 50 injections. So you, you calibrate it, titrate it, and make sure that you inject into each of this. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a wheel of about two centimeters apart, okay? So each of the wheel then overlaps with each other so you get a large area of coverage. You must get a visible wheel on that thing. And the injection is not subdermal. The injection is intradermal because you want the nerves to be activated. You want to act on the nerves. You want to block the acetylcholine. So you actually inject intradermally. And this is what you do. Look at the multiple injections that he has had. And then this starts to show its effect in a week's time, they start to see the effect. And if you repeat the minor starch test, what I showed you earlier was what is called as a minor starch test, then you can see that the area is actually reduced dramatically following treatment. So this is the way you follow up these patients. Uh, you will see the effect in about a week's time. 25% of these guys will actually have the effect even up to one year. So the effect can last even up to one year but many of them need repeat treatments. And botulinum toxin A is safe enough to do repeated therapeutic injections up to the point where the patient cannot take it anymore. And then you've got to offer him surgery as the next step. So Botox is quite a good therapy for using hyperhidrosis, particularly in the axilla, also used for palm. Okay, not so good for face, but good for palm and axilla. Iontophoresis. What happens in iontophoresis? You take tap water and you put the feet in the tap water and you connect it to this machine which allows electricity to go through it. And there is a positive to negative charge which goes through this system. Of course, it is a, it's a regulated charge. It's a very low charge. And you do the session for 20 minutes for every two to three days. What it causes, the real pathology is not clear. Nobody knows exactly why iontophoresis works. But again, they say because of the change of the charge from positive to negative, there is shedding of the epithelium as a result of which there's plugging of the sweat glands. Also, they say because the positive negative changes, the pH of the sweat gland changes, and that causes blockage of the sympathetic nerve transmission by increasing the threshold of the stimulus. And some people say there is change in cellular secretory physiology. So it's not really clear, but the bottom line is there is definitely a positive to negative change moment these ions are passed through these water and that area is placed in it. And that change in the pH is what triggers the sweat glands to stop forming sweat and triggers the neurophysiology to stop forming the sweat. Okay. Uh, the NICE guidelines talk about oral glycopyronium bromide for, um, for hyperhidrosis, but actually it is an off-the-label use of this drug. So there is really no clear-cut evidence 
whether this drug orally given works or doesn't work. There is another therapy that's available for these patients. Uh, guys, is it making sense so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With me? Okay, good. Yes, sir. This, yes, sir. This is not about that sympathectomy. Okay, this is about understanding the whole treatment of hyperhidrosis. Okay, so we have done. We gave the patient uh, aluminium uh, chloride. We tried that, didn't work. We've then given him um, uh, Botox injections. Uh, some centers will give iontophoresis. Some centers will give oral medication to see if it works for the anti-muscarinic effects. And then there is one more technique which is available, which is called as percutaneous sympathectomy. Now, percutaneous sympathectomy is something where you actually block the sympathetic nerve with either phenol or nowadays you can even use radio frequency ablation, RF ablation. So what you do is you actually take the patient into onto a radiology uh, table and use a C arm and under C arm guidance, you put in a needle into the paravertebral space and identify. So it's just like putting in a block. And what happens with this is you get a temporary block of the sympathetic chain. This is a very good technique for understanding whether your sympathectomy will work in the patient or not. So very often you're worried that you might cut away the sympathetic chain, but the patient will get severe compensatory hyperhidrosis. But by the time he gets hyperhidrosis, it's too late. There's nothing you can do. You've already cut the sympathetic chain. So a lot of centers in the US now do pre-operative percutaneous sympathectomy. So they give the patient a trial of sympathectomy, but this is not a permanent destruction of the sympathetic chain. It blocks it and they wait for a few weeks to see if the patient is actually getting compensatory hyperhidrosis or not. And if the patient gets compensatory hyperhidrosis and it is not affecting his life, or if he doesn't get compensatory hyperhidrosis, this is the guy you put up for thoracoscopic sympathectomy. If this patient gets severe compensatory hyperhidrosis, which is worse than his initial disease, then it's not a guy that you want to put through a thoracoscopic sympathectomy. So this actually helps to prevent medical legal cases. And it helps to identify who are the patients who will benefit with, uh, with uh, surgical intervention. Because surgical intervention, A, besides being a, you know, a metabolic trauma to the body, it is also a permanent procedure. So you really got to be very careful about what you do. And a lot of people now have started doing percutaneous sympathectomy. So here you are, this is the thing under C arm guidance. They put in a needle, they use the C arm to identify exactly where they are, and then they will inject either an RF probe or they will inject a bit of phenol or something like that to temporarily block the, block the sympathetic ganglion and see what is the response in these patients. Now, again, you need a very experienced radiologist, a very experienced interventional radiologist who knows what he's doing before you start doing anything like this. Uh, in the private market, there are a few other treatments that are available because one of the surgical methods that was there early uh, in this process before rats uh, big, became big was uh, resection of the axillary skin to take away the sweat glands. And that is a horrible thing to do. Imagine resecting the axillary skin and then suturing it back with all its associated complications. So a lot of people have come up with newer technologies. So they have got this machine in the market called as vaser liposuction. It's not laser, it's a vaser liposuction. And what they do is they make a small incision underneath the skin of the axilla and the local, and they put in this liposuction machine. And using the liposuction machine, they push in ultrasonic waves. And the ultrasonic waves go and destroy the sweat glands. And so you, if you've got just localized axillary, um, localized axillary hyperhidrosis, and you don't want to undergo a thoracic surgery, this might actually work for you. Uh, but again, really the outcomes, the data is not very clear on this. 
uh, what is the outcome. But most of the private clinics who do this claim great success, but it is not randomized control and things like that. So I worry about these treatments, but they are available out there. So laser is available for ultrasonic techniques. We've got laser and laser is done two ways. One is you can make this, see this cut here? They've made a cut and under vision, thoracoscopic vision, they are actually destroying the sweat glands. So what they're doing is they're burning the intradermal area from the inside. And that they say gives you uh, adequate uh, response for axillary hyperhidrosis. Some people go the other way. There are some dermatologists who actually use superficial laser. So they put these points, they put do the miners test, and then under vision, each point, instead of injecting it with Botox, they apply laser to it and they try to destroy the sweat glands into that area. So there are a lot of other techniques that are available. There's one more technique available, which is called as Mira Dry. Now, Mira Dry actually applies electromagnetic energy. So here is the machine and here is this, and they've marked out this area and they apply this probe to the axilla and the Mira Dry destroys the uh, sweat glands, thereby preventing the excessive sweating that happens in the axilla. Again, all these things are available in the market, very, very much uh, sought after by the cosmetic dermatologists, uh, a big money-making uh, market, but evidence is not clear. Each one of them claims 80% cure, 90% cure, but they really don't have the evidence to support them. So if you want to use this, you have to use it in level one and level two uh, hyperhidrosis patients rather than in level three and four. I really am not sure whether they will work wonders in level three or four. But again, there is not much uh, evidence for that. So surgery is usually preferred in patients who have failed conservative therapy, okay? So patients who have not, who, all patients must undergo conservative treatment. There should be no patient that you should operate straight away because uh, it's really not the protocol of management. So all patients should try conservative therapy. If it doesn't work, then you've got the option of doing what is called as VAX sympathectomy or endoscopic thoracic sympathectomy, ETS. A lot of uh, books call it ETS. Some books call it VAX sympathectomy. Uh, and then I told you in the old days, they used to do subcutaneous excision of the sweat glands. I think that's a messy surgery. I think nobody does that anymore. Um, so this is the CPAR guidelines for surgical management. And I'll go through each one of this in a bit, okay? So what is the level of evidence? The level of evidence for surgery, surgical treatment is very high. It's a level of, a level of recommendation one. And if you have to do surgical treatment after failed conservative treatment, Wax sympathectomy or endoscopic thoracoscopic sympathectomy, the level of recommendation is one. So it's a very high level of recommendation. Uh, for Palmer hyperhidrosis, it's very high. It says it's very effective for Palmer hyperhidrosis. When you come into the axillary and the craniofacial areas, hyperhidrosis, it is still strong, but it is a lower le level of recommendation. But remember, this is level one to eight. So three is still quite a decent level of recommendation. So you are perfectly justified in offering VAT sympathectomy for a patient with Palmer hyperhidrosis. You're justified in offering uh, VAT sympathectomy for a patient with axillary or craniofacial hyperhidrosis. But the most important thing is you have to have a detailed discussion with the patient about the benefits, but more importantly, a clear documentation of the side effects, the discussion of the side effects, because these are well patients and you are going to, potentially going to give them side effects. You got to be very, very careful and all literature, everything has said that it is mandatory to have a discussion of the side effects of surgical treatment. You cannot do this surgery willy-nilly. You really need to discuss carefully with the patient, okay? Okay, let's do the next one. Now, STS nomenclature is different. STS is Society of Thoracic Surgery. They don't call it as T. They call it as R. 
So they name the rib as R. So if it is R1, it is rib 1. If it is R2, it is rib 2. So they have said, refer the number of the rib as following R. So it is R3, R2, R1, because it is the level of the rib that you're cutting the sympathetic chain. The next thing they have said is you must mention whether you cut the chain at the top of the rib or at the bottom of the rib. So instead of calling it as T, uh, because when you say thoracic ganglion I cut, you really don't know where exactly he has cut. And the reason why this change has been done is because more and more people are now seeking recanalization or rip, you know, to undo the surgery. So you really need to know from one surgeon to another exactly where has this guy cut the rib, uh, cut the sympathetic chain. So they say that you must name the rib as R, you must name the number of the rib which corresponds to the R, you must name it whether you have cut the top of the rib, at the top of the rib, or whether you have cut it at the bottom of the rib. And you've got to follow it with talking what is the procedure that you've done. So it's not just sympathectomy, you can't just say it's sympathectomy. So if your operation note reads like this, it says, cauterized R4, bottom R4. It means you have cauterized the top of R4, you have cauterized the bottom of R4, and you've taken away the middle part of the sympathetic chain. So this is the nomenclature that is now used across the world. More and more people, are, the surgeons particularly, are talking this language. So this T1, T2 is not being spoken of. More and more of, uh, of us are now talking about R. And we're talking about the number of R. We're talking about top or bottom. And we're talking about what did you do? Did you put a liger clip? Did you cut it? What is exactly that you did? So you can either transect it and you can say you did transaction. You can reject it, which means you transacted it in two areas. When you talk transaction, you're just talking about one cut. You just cut the sympathetic chain, one above, one below, you left it. Resection means you cut at the top of the rib, you cut at the bottom of the rib, and you take away the middle part. You have to mention whether you used a diathermy, so whether you ablated with cautery, or did you ablate it with a harmonic scalpel, and or did you apply clips? And most of the surgeons in the US now, particularly the people who go to resected, the ones who are doing resected, actually will take out that tissue and will send it to the lab to prove histology that you actually took out the sympathetic chain. Because again, I said, these are very litigious patients. They're psychologically very distraught. And there's a high incidence of medical legal cases in these scenarios. So either you record your surgery and you share your surgery with the patient, but I would never do it because that's putting yourself at risk for medical legal things or you give the patient a histopathological diagnosis, a pathology report which actually proves to the patient that he had the surgery. So it's quite important, you know, you're dealing with a very difficult group of patients. So these are the type of interruptions that you do in sympathectomy. Um, So these are all the guidelines. These are all the papers that are there across the board. Many, 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 many people doing different things, T2, T3, T4, T5, whatever. Now I'm going to simplify it. Only two guidelines. One is CPAR and one is STS. And I'll tell you exactly what to do in what patient, okay? I'm sorry this animation is rubbish, but let me just go through it. So let's start at the top. Wherever you're seeing T, it comes from the Spanish guidelines. Whenever you see R, it is coming from the FCS guideline. So let's go through this very carefully. So if you have got facial, please write this down or take a screenshot of this uh, document because this is the key for your answer in the exam. So if the patient has got facial hyperhidrosis, then you cut T2 and T3. Level of recommendation is two. So very high level of recommendation. STS says rather than T2, it talks about R3. 
because actually you're pretty close. T2 lies between R1 and R2. So you're not uh, R2 and R3. So SGS says you transact at the top of R3. Rather than doing R2 or R3, you just transact at the top of R3. The reason for this is that there is a higher incidence of Horner's syndrome when you transact at the top of R2. Did you understand this? It's very important to understand this. So the, the SPEAR guideline says T2, T3 <coughs> for facial hyperhidrosis. The STS says R3 rather than R2 because you don't want an incidence of Horner's syndrome or transaction of T1. That's the first guideline. The second guideline says for Palmer hyperhidrosis, you go T3 or T4. Stop is a mistake. It's T3 and or T4. Level of recommendation two. The STS guideline says above R4, which means close to T3, plus particularly if there is plantar involvement as well. So for, if there is plantar involvement, you go down to R5. If there's only Palmer, you stick to R4. The axillary hyperhidrosis, the SPEAR guideline says T4 or T5. Level of recommendation two. The STS says if there is Palmer in association with axillary, in association with plantar, then go top of R4 and R5. So really you're getting T4 and T5. The most important in all of this guideline, this is the key to surgery. This is very important to understand. This slide is the most important slide for surgeons because this is what will back you when you do your surgery. The most important thing is careful not to damage stellate ganglion because you do not want Horner's syndrome. So don't get confused about T2 and R. It's very similar. It's just R is at the top of the rib and T2 is actually at the stellate ganglion, at the, at the ganglion, thoracic ganglion. So it's, it's almost the same, but slightly the level of transaction is lower or above. So STS is more realistic because that is what we do. We actually transect on the top of the rib or on the bottom of the rib. That's the way we identify where we are in the whole picture. Okay, so this is the SPEAR guideline. I'm showing you actually from the paper, the guideline. So everything that we are speaking about is from the guidelines, okay? Nothing that is coming outside of the guidelines, okay? so. The other thing that they have said is always interrupt the nerve of Kunz. <coughs> so it's not enough just to cut the trans thoracic sympathetic chain. You have to go laterally to cut the nerves of Kunz. The surgery must be offered bilaterally because most of these are sequential bilateral disease, similar disease on both sides. So you should not do one at a time, you should do both at the same sitting. And the level of recommendation is two for that. The position that you have to take for doing a uh, endoscopic thoracic, thoracic sympathectomy is semi fowler's position. I'll show you that in a minute. You should do it preferably with one port. This surgery should be done with a single port. However, a second port can be used, it's okay. Again, the level of recommendation is two. You should not try to put in a chest drain into these patients. What you have to do is as soon as you finish your surgery, you pull out your uh, scope, put in a camera, uh, put in a drain, and put the drain in a bowl of fluid and let the lung re-expand by asking the patient to cough or under anesthesia, you get the guy to blow up the lung and all the bubbles are out, 
you pull it out and the stitch is the first string is already there you just tie it off and that's it so you should try not to put a drain and if you do leave in a drain then the drain must come out as soon as possible preferably in the recovery room within couple of hours you do the chest x-ray and you make sure because sometimes you're worried you might have made a hole in the lung or something like that because of the diathermy and you just make sure that there is no air leak and you take it out as soon as possible and this is one of the surgeries which is actually a day surgery in thoracic surgery so this is a day surgery in fact in the us most of the people do this as an outpatient surgery so you don't even admit the patient to hospital the patient just comes to your clinic your clinic has an or next door you go in there you do the surgery and within 4 hours the patient is discharged and look to the right all of this is level of recommendation 2 so it is a very high level everything is backed by by uh, evidence consistent recommendation moderate quality of evidence so very very good level of evidence for doing all of these things that i'm telling you to do so this is what it is coming i'm just talking about the same guidelines this is what is called as a semi fowler's position so you have a patient lying 30 to 45 degrees and usually you have the arms out actually so that you can get access to the uh, axillary area and you put in a small incision 3 mm uh, incision is usually enough a 3 mm millimeter telescope there is a telescope available which has a hook diathermy at the tip and there is a telescope on the same device and you go in with the device you push the hook diathermy and you buzz and you come out so it's it's a very very straightforward procedure i'll just show you this video to show you what vat sympathectomy looks like um, i'm going to keep quiet for one second you have to make two parallel incisions on the pericardium it's called as uh, railway track lines and then you hook up the sympathetic chain now you can do divisions at two levels and you can either resect it or you can transect it in this particular procedure we are transecting it rather than resecting it but a lot of people now have started doing resection of the things the most important thing is to go laterally you have to go laterally because what you want to do is get the nerve of kunz you need to get the nerve of kunz out so we are doing this at two levels i don't remember what was the indication for surgery now you see that aorta bumping next to the diathermy instrument when we talk about complications remind me i'll tell you about a case where the diathermy touched the aorta there was hell to pay when we had a sudden burst from the aorta during my training years my boss was doing the surgery and he nicked the aorta and we were on bypass and we were doing etc 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 so the surgery is quite straightforward is the decision making that is very important in this surgery and the important thing is to go laterally now we are putting in a drain in these in those days it was done but nowadays nobody puts in a drain uh when you were operating how do you know that you've got the sympathetic chain this one was clearly visible but sometimes you it may not be visible you don't know whether you have actually got the sympathetic chain or not so what you do is you put a pulse oximeter on the finger of the hand that you are operating on the side that you are operating and you will see an increase in the width of the wave the moment the sympathectomy is done immediately you see the change and the other way is you can put a temperature sensor on the thinar eminence of the hand on the side that you are operating and the moment you do that you will see 
an increase of more than 0.5 degrees centigrade in that end. And that signifies that you have actually cut the sympathetic chain. This question is asked very often in the MCQ. How do you know that you have done, not in the MCQ, in the clinical exam, how do you know that you have actually successfully done a sympathectomy? And the answer is you either put in a pulse oximeter on the finger or you put a temperature sensor on the thin R eminence. And that will tell you whether your technique has been successful or not, or whether you've got erroneous tissue. Okay, what are the complications? There are many complications of this procedure. Not many complications, but there are some complications which you may face. Pneumothorax, there has been report of phrenic nerve injury. I don't know how the hell people did phrenic nerve injury, but there have been reports. There have been reports of chylothorax. There have been report of Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome is definitely one of the things that we do see, particularly when we are doing sympathectomy for uh, JLN syndrome and we are doing hemistellate ganglionectomy. This is possible. A lot of people get excessive dryness in the hand because the sympathectomy is super successful. So they go the reverse. Their, their hand can become very coarse. Uh, sometimes patients get what is called as a ghost sweating, which means that the patient feels that he's sweating, but really, if you look at the hand, that is dry. So this is called as a ghost sweating. It, take, it usually goes away in three months, but a lot of patients suffer from ghost sweating when this happens. And some people get gustatory sweating, uh, which is, uh, you know, you've done a sympathectomy for palmar and axillary hyperidosis. And for some reason, whenever they eat food, they get a flushing of the face. So that is something that people do get, and that causes them a problem. A compensatory hyperhidrosis is a real problem, and it's a real thing. And this has to be discussed very carefully and very clearly with the patient. Most literatures have a huge variety. Some people say 10% to 65%, but an average of 45% is seen. For most patients, it's bearable. It's not such a big problem. Usually, it has been seen that the compensatory hyperhidrosis reduces with time. And if you look after two years, about 10% of patients will still have it. But it is bearable because they say that it is better than having that excessive sweating that I was having. So they can manage compensatory hyperidosis, but they cannot manage uh, the primary disease. And it usually happens in another area for some reason. But 1% have persistent unbearable hyperhidrosis. And that is something that is a real problem. And there is really no solution for that besides giving conservative treatment. There have been discussions of re-anastomosis of the nerve, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Reversal of sympathectomy is a concept that's been spoken of. That's why a lot of people have started using clips, and they say that if you remove the clip within one month, uh, the, uh, you know, the effect is reversed, the compensatory hyperidosis goes away. Uh, but you have to do a redo surgery to go in and take that clip out. Uh, there are a lot. Uh, there are some uh, reports coming in of end-to-end -end nerve anastomosis, where people have had to do a thoracotomy, go back in and do an end-to-end -end nerve anastomosis. Some people have spoken about nerve graft because a resection was done rather than just a transaction of the sympathetic chain. And when you've done a resection and you've taken out a piece of the nerve, then you got to replace it with either intercostal nerve or sural nerve. And a very close friend of mine uh, from uh, Taiwan has actually now started talking about sympathetic nerve reconstruction using the robot. So he has done, uh, I think, about five cases of robotic microsurgical uh, reconstruction of the, uh, for reversal of sympathectomy uh, using sural nerve. He's also used intercostal nerve. And uh, he has actually recently published. Uh, I was with him last month. and. Uh, he showed me, of course, he doesn't have the results as yet because it's just a recent series. So all these uh, reversals take six months to a year to know whether it is worth it or not. So this is something. This is just to show you the data that's available for clip removal. Uh, some people have said there is a lot of improvement, but again, you know, there are still people, you know, it's from 64, 52% to 100%. So who knows what is the answer? But uh, people are talking about reversal of sympathectomy. So what are the long-term outcomes? Uh, a lot of them have resolution of symptoms, 85 to 
some people have re recurrence of symptoms secondary to nerve regeneration compensatory hydrosis sometimes can be more severe than the original symptoms and then you got to go in and do a second surgery or really give them conservative management uh, and most of these patients have increased body perspiration in response to heat um, there are other indications for sympathectomy uh, these are part of the guidelines uh, there is indication for facial flushing and blushing that's an r2 indication uh, level of uh, recommendation 2 uh, Raynaud's sy syndrome is not so hot uh, really the outcomes are very unreliable uh, level of recommendation is 4 for refractory angina as well sympathectomy has been used and uh, again with mixed results not really convincing that you are getting good results but uh, untreatable abdominal pain uh, has been used actually particularly for uh, for pancreatic pancreatitis uh, and what you do is uh, splanchinectomy splanchinectomy is uh, there are three nerves called as greater lesser and least splanchnic nerves <clears throat> these arise from the lower thoracic ganglion so from the last ganglion it arises and then goes across the diaphragm and goes into the uh, goes into the splanchnic uh, uh, system and uh, the level of resection has been described variously some people say from r4 downwards some people only do r9 r10 it depends on the symptoms of the patient uh, so these go across into the abdominal solar plexus the indication usually for doing it is uh, for severe pancreatitis so you go in the chest to sort out the pancreatitis but you do not use the the propped up position you actually have the patient completely down and you have got to go uh, in an anti-grade fashion your triangulation is reversed when you go in to the angle of the diaphragm because this is very low in the chest uh, it's also used for abdominal neoplasms for pancreatic cancer particularly for relief of pain uh, and one of the side effects of it is that it improves the peristalsis, particularly patients with pancreatitis who are constipated actually end up going the other way because of the increased parasympathetic activity. Because you have taken away the sympathetic chain, so the parasympathetic activity kicks in and the peristalsis improves, and then these patients have more uh, bowel movement. Uh, so these are the guidelines. This is directly from the guidelines with the level of recommendation. There is one more indication. This we have been involved with this actually, uh, where uh, we offer sympathectomy for patients with refractory refractory ventricular arrhythmias, or patients with prolonged QT syndromes. Uh, these are young boy, young kids uh, who are coming in with recurrent uh, uh, cardiac arrest, uh, ventricular tachycardias, and we actually go into the chest and uh, you know you do a sympathectomy and i have done three of these so far and i'll tell you it's a dramatic result you immediately see the uh, the vt stop and you get a reversal of the vt uh, i have some friends uh, who have done i think more than 25 or 30 of these and this has been uh, this has been driven by shiv kumar kalyanam from uh, ucla and uh, he along with yash lokanwala has now published a lot of work on this use of sympathectomy for refractory ventricular arrhythmias thank you guys i'm going to stop sharing and i'll get everybody in and uh, we will start taking questions um, did we record this or not for god's sake i hope we have recorded one yes minute. sir it was recording was it recording yeah god yeah, it's Hello. recording yeah good one and a half hours huh? bloody hell <laughs> all right okay tell me did this make sense this was a very comprehensive yes, review of all the literature out there i went through everything uh, all the textbooks and all the internet sites and everything and i tried to give you everything in a nutshell so that you, you you know everything. Okay, Sarvanam Krishna Raja. Oh, enjoying the video. Okay, <laughs> tell me. Questions? Yeah, Manjunath. Come closer, I can't hear you. Your voice is very far away. So the question is, uh, 
uh, how uh, what about the risk of bradycardia after the intersection yeah 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 it is there there is a risk of bradycardia i forgot to mention it in the complication yes and there is a group of patients who are to get bradycardia you have to treat them with atropine uh, or or appropriate uh, drugs it is treated medically okay uh, for a patient for a young patient should we counsel him in the preoperative phase regarding the risk of bradycardia one minute i can't hear you man speak closer to the mic sorry uh, for a young patient yeah who is talking first manjunath manjunath okay manjunath carry on yeah for a young patient who, who has yeah. come for a thrombectomy uh, should we really explain the risk of bradycardia and uh, yeah. will it because once one of the patient uh, refused surgery after i explained him the risk I, of bradycardia i tell you it's better that they refuse than have them have the complication and informed consent is informed consent you have to talk to them about everything okay. you cannot selectively talk because bradycardia is a genuine uh, risk that we've seen okay thank you so informed consent means you must talk everything it's okay yaar it's okay to lose one or two patients but at least these are very painful patients they keep coming back into your clinic they don't go away and okay. uh, you know everything that happens to them is then because of your sympathectomy so it's better to be very honest with them at the start better to lose them i i am happy when a very troublesome guy wants to go away it's okay <laughs> but uh, if you want to do it you know it's a small surgery for us but uh, this is really a team team work people who do this actually do it as a full time uh, sympathetic surgery and they have clinics where they have got uh, psychologists dermatologists uh, you know physicians and themselves so okay. it's it's not uh, for an occasional surgery it's fun for us to do it occasionally but if you want to seriously do this hyperhidrosis surgery you have to set up a business practice a proper clinic where people come and you take care and all the conservative management also should be in the same setup okay thank you sir okay thanks yeah who's next anybody else wants to ask questions or you're all very happy yes, sir because, vikas yes sir my yes, boy sir. tell me <laughs> it is a very traumatic question this thing was my case in my frcs exam oh, so no, i was told just take a quick history so history i i did fine then he just told me examine his hands and there was a very big pause what are the things i am going to look so if i am told examine his hands what are the things i am supposed to do i check for sweating i check for tremors telling him that i am i want to see whether he has hypothyroidism what are the things i need to see sir oh my he, god he just i mean his hands and then no. he uh, there was a big pause no no what what do you have to do and see any time you do anything there is a pattern to examination don't forget yes. the pattern and the pattern is inspection percussion uh, pa inspection palpation percussion auscultation okay no matter what he says you have to do all of these things i'm not saying you auscultate the hand but you have to auscultate the whole patient because the symptom in the hand could be because of thoracic outlet syndrome you don't know that so you cannot just examine the hand and stop at that you have to start with your general examination look at everything do uh, if anybody asks me in an exam i will start with general examination i'll look at all his stuff and then if he stops me and says only look at his hand then i'll look at his hand again you have to do inspection you got to you know look for the seven s's and one i look for the you know skin scars sinuses seen in pulses it's all standard but you have to do everything it's a drama man it's a drama but you have got to go through the whole drama you got to practice to do the drama no matter what if he tells you to examine the toe do the same damn thing every single time and that is why i say keep doing it e english exams are all uh, you know about uh, about method it's not about uh, it's not about reaching a diagnosis it's about a method and lot of marking is on the method now if in inspection if he asks you to inspect you have to look at everything you have to talk and keep talking as you are talking seven s is one i is inspection you know that is no matter what whether you look at his scrotum or you look at his hand it is the same thing so you do the same things with the hand uh, i don't know whether you touch uh, check for power grip uh, pulsation uh, sweating scars sinuses uh, skin over the things compared it with the other side whether you look for tremors these are all standard in the thing i can't tell you till i see you doing it 
what are you doing wrong you, you understand that but it's all a drama you have to do everything and it's not just examine the hand you got to also feel for pulses you got to examine the vascular thing you got to examine the neural thing you got to examine the uh, uh, what is it vein artery and bronchus uh, vein artery and nerve everything you have to examine you have to examine for movements you have to examine for power grip these are all standard examinations look into achisens it talks about examination of a hand achisens is giving you the how to examine a hand is well documented in achisens Oh, okay uh, and then second question i think you have answered the, he said told me how will you identify the level where you are going to uh, divide so now standard answer is we have to go with the ribs yeah go level. with the ribs that is ribs. sts guideline yes i would have told him sts guideline states this means this yes sir and sts everybody knows even if they don't know spear they know sts spear was the older one everybody followed it but now everybody talks sts and it's very well documented very clear very quick so my suggestion is go through my this lecture again once i put it on youtube and come back to that slide where i have spoken about what is the level to be dissected it's very clear there is no confusion in that and after we have done this surgery do we still follow them with medications uh depends on the symptoms so in the okay. follow up if people have recurrence of symptoms or if symptoms have not improved Uh, he's still getting a little bit more sweating in the axilla give him a uh, give him aluminum chloride uh, you know powder or something like that so yeah it depends on the symptom of the patient but it's not your treatment you go get the dermatologist to treat him very quickly refer this guys on don't be still in your clinic <laughs> real pain i'm telling you i don't know how arun prasad runs his clinic but i would go mad if i had a patient coming back with repeated cribbing about his symptoms uh hello okay. thanks yeah hi silpa arun so i <laughs> no i'm not ah, okay you said a lot of things and i'm really sorry it was really an interrupted uh, attendance of mine of this very important topic but uh, i need your uh, guidance or maybe you know your advice how do you manage recurrence after eds oh my god very difficult <laughs> very very I mean, difficult uh recurrence after Good. ets I mean, no no recurrence after ets is usually managed conservatively there is very little by what for, yes. for conservative the four things that i told you okay, uh, botox aluminum injection aluminum chloride and all those things aluminum oh, okay. chloride botox injections uh mm. by iantophoresis uh, mm. and uh, probably sending him to your uh, uh, other surgeon whom you don't like <laughs> you know <something. laughs> so, uh, no uh, recurrence is a problem uh yeah. redo re, uh, to undo the surgery is not uh, so easy and to redo yeah. thoracoscopic sympathectomy is not recommended i don't know of any paper where they talk about redo thoracoscopic sympathectomy following a previous uh, surgery i don't know anybody else who goes in and knocks off some more levels uh, i have not come across it yeah uh, another question is uh, related to the surgical technique so do you just advise transecting the sympathetic chain or you know excising a particular segment of the sympathetic the, the do you US, have the difference? us guys yeah yeah the us guys particularly like to there's one group who only clips it uh, the atlanta mm. guys only clip it but there's one group which actually takes away a resection and sends yeah. it for histopathology uh, they they actually send it for histopathology and uh, uh they they give the pathology report to the patient saying i have done a uh, a resection it's very very individual choice there is no no clear cut evidence on one over the other which is better hmm. any difference in the outcome of both the no, procedures there is no or there no are... evidence no if there was some okay. paper which said a was better than b everybody would do it because it's such an easy procedure it's not a difficult procedure yeah. so there is no mm-hmm. paper which says a is better than b is better than c so nobody has mm-hmm. any particular preference over any one particular type mm-hmm. most of the times these are driven by the patient these patients read a lot they google a lot yes. they have a lot of websites that they have read and they come back and tell you what surgery they want and mm-hmm. to be honest as as a thoracic surgeon you just do whatever they want because it doesn't matter to you as a surgeon Uh, because you know to do all three 
you know you yeah. know how to do transaction you know how to put in a clip and you know how to do a resection so usually these are very motivated patients these are young guys you know they're all less than 25 young guys they've mm. read they've googled everything and they come to you and they will tell you what they want i've had somebody who came and told me i want robotic sympathectomy i mean robotic sympathectomy uh, for god's sake what do you want to talk a robot for that there's no mm. i want a robotic one. so these are these are crazy people you've got to be very careful okay mm -hmm. okay okay yeah thank you all right. Anybody else? Did, did you guys enjoy this talk? Was it okay? I mean, I really went into great depths to, yes. to cover everything possible, including the investigations and things like that. You My won't find it in one textbook. Yeah, nightmare. that's why I addressed it. Yes. Yes. I yeah, think it's not there in textbook. Because you are my dear boy, that's why I covered ah. the topic. <laughs> sir, 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 I am going add, uh, to add link, uh, thoracic outlet obstruction also, sir. That's my Stop next one. Cleared. Because that's my next one, okay? It is, a very, difficult, it. It is a very difficult topic, sir. Very uh, difficult. That's my next that topic also. to do. Thoracic my outlet favorite outlet. topic it is. I have lots okay, of okay. questions in that. Quite, quite, quite. Next, next question. Next question. We got a lot of people from overseas. So anybody else wants to ask? Uh, sir, good evening. Vivek here. Hi, Vivek. Tell me. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the uh, for the lecture. Very informative. Uh, so, just uh, like, uh, is there any um, uh, like uh, literature on uh, when you're saying that uh, you're supposed to resect at say R two R three level? I mean, you know, on top and bottom of the ribs by cautery or by clips. Hmm. Um, suppose inadvertently the uh, ganglia are uh, you know severed or uh, I mean damaged. Uh, that leads to Horner syndrome. Is there no, any? No, that's only for T1. Only T1. for T1. T1. So even only if the uh, even if the ganglia below are damaged, doesn't really matter. You actually take away the ganglia. People who resect, they take away okay. the ganglia. So it's only okay. T1 that you've got to be careful. I, I because I do this for uh, JLN syndrome, I have to do what is called as a hemistellate ganglionectomy, which means the lower half of the ganglion. You actually have to identify and just cut the lower half and take it out. That is when the risk of um, uh, Horner's is high. And also when you are taking out thoracic outlet tumors or when you're doing uh, surgery in the thoracic outlet, that's uh, when you have a risk of damage of uh, T1. In a sympathectomy, you should not really damage T1 mm. unless you're really crazy and you don't know your anatomy. Or if there is an anatomical variation, <laughs> But that can happen. Anatomical variations can happen. And you didn't recognize it, then uh, you're in trouble. I have another question. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, sir, about this intractable AF the, or the refractory AF, which needs this uh, hemi yeah. T1 ganglionectomy. Yes. So, what is your cutoff? When do you take up this patient for, uh, you know, the hemiganglionectomy? When do you, after, what is the cutoff after, of the AF? No, after the cardiologist has, it, the, 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 the decision for surgery is driven by the cardiologist rather than you as a surgeon. Uh, because this, uh, you are the technician in this surgery. The cardiologist actually, they try a lot of things. They, they try various medications. They try various techniques. And when all of them fail, that is when they come to you. So usually you are the last resort that they come to. And, and these are not easy patients to operate on. Remember, you have to give a general anesthesia with a double lumen tube for patients uh, who are arresting. So I, I actually have a cardiologist in theater and I have mm. a, a you know, defibrillator and everything in theater and they arrest, they arrest. While you're operating, they arrest. So they are not easy and they're young kids. And usually these kids will have a sibling who had a sudden death. That's how oh. the second sibling gets picked up because the first sibling had sudden death and you don't know why he died and then the second sibling starts to show so and so these are very traumatized families. So you've got to be very careful about how you select them. You're the last port of call usually. Uh, now I think the cardiologists are starting to wake up after uh, Shiv's paper came, came out, the cardiologists are saying, okay, Let's see if we can uh, get to the thing. I had a case in Medanta who was referred to me and because I could not be there at that time, they actually went ahead and did a stellate ganglion uh, injection. They, mm -hmm. they, they got uh, an anesthetist to inject the sympathetic chain and that actually gave them some time
to to bypass it and then they put in a a, a fibrillator uh, you know one of those permanent pacemakers they put in and okay. so that way they got away with that child but who knows he may come back again with problems and we might have to do a second thing but usually you have to do bilateral it doesn't work on unilateral mm-hmm. okay next okay. question thank you it's little bit uh, out of topic is lumbar sympathetic still being done sir for the mm. vascular is it being done yeah. sir yeah yeah, yes. yeah by the general surgeon sir okay they are doing general surgeons do lumbar sympathetic uh, but very often uh, the abdominal pain ones are done by the thoracic surgeon because the greater lesser and least splanking nerves arise mm. in the in the chest Correct. not in the Splank abdomen the yes so you actually got to go in the chest and you got to go and uh, knock it off so that uh, you can get relief in the and these are terminal patients pancreatic ca pancreas they are having uh, serious pain issues nothing is touching them you've given them morphine infusion etc 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 and so you just uh, you know try to give them whatever best so this is like a like a palliative procedure but uh, also uh, there has been some work on angina a refractory angina some people have had done some sympathectomies and they have had relief but again it's a hit and miss not sure whether it works for all patients so very difficult to know which patient it will work for <clears throat> and particularly refractory angina and somebody who is getting angina and you have to give a general anesthesia the problem is we have to give a general anesthesia so you know it's a very difficult situation to get into for us it's very easy for me it takes 10 minutes 15 minutes work but the anesthetist is sweating so it's a team effort okay next question how are we happy so we take a 5 minute break and then we do vikas's yes. uh, media spinal masses vikas are you ready do you want to Can do it take... or do you, want, do you want to do tomorrow longer break we we can do it we can do it tomorrow sir yes, i don't yes. mind whatever whoever wants yes, whatever you tell me yes, okay fine good yeah. so if you want to call it a day we've almost done one and a half hour in fact two hours now so yes, bloody hell nobody in the world will lecture two hours on <laughs> on <laughs> hyper thoracic surgery okay? definitely, so definitely you should be thankful to me for coming yes, definitely sir <laughs> okay all right so <laughs> let's call it a day thank you very much uh, you. welcome amina to the group amina is from london amina did you, you, did you did you enjoy the talk did you understand all of it did it satisfy your prof. requirements for the exam yes prof i it was absolutely a delightful talk and to be honest well, i think you have touched base with everything and there was nothing that you have left well done thank you <laughs> thank you thank you guys keep thank inspiring you. me so i will do it for you okay yes. no prof much all appreciated right. all right okay thank you thanks thank uh, nikhil is saying something one, one minute just hang on hang on nikhil is saying something what is he written i am not sure he's written something shall we do a trial of ct scan sharing from desktop yeah go ahead uh, while we are online let me stop the recording where is the recording where is it where is it where is the recording that you are yeah